Good morning. Welcome to the International Educational Conference uh, from Maria Grzegorzewska University in Warsaw. Welcome to the first uh, plenary session. Uh, I would like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Bernadette Brereton from ISA, International Sociological Association. Dr. Brereton is the research network coordinator for research network number 10, which is a research network on education. So thank you so much for being, for being with us uh, here today and the floor is yours. Thank you, Anna. Can you see my slides? You can, excellent. Okay, so I would very much like to be with you in Warsaw today. Um, actually, before these days of lockdown, it was one of the great privileges of being uh, a member of the ESA to be able to travel and present at conferences. And I have very fond memories of a trip to Warsaw and also to the beautiful old town of Torun. Um, and also to a midterm conference we had with the Sociology of Education Research Network 10 in uh, Wroclaw in Silesia. And apologies for my pronunciation, Anna. But of course, it's also lovely to be able to present to you virtually today. And uh, sincere thanks to you, Anna, and your colleagues for the invitation. So as Anna said, my name is Bernadette Burton. I'm Irish. I'm the coordinator of the European Sociological Association Sociology of Education Research Network. That's Research Network 10. And I can see that some of my colleagues are on the call this morning. And so hi to you. Um, as I said, I feel privileged today to speak to you about the capacity for the sociology of education to make a positive impact in education and society. Um, I'm hoping to be able to share some relevant and recent examples from um, our research. Um, and I'd like to consider in that the ways that interdisciplinary and inclusive collaborative approaches can yield amazing results uh, with benefits both personally for those involved and indeed for the whole education sector. Um, and I'm hoping there'll be a, a, a good discussion at the end and that you'll uh, engage me in anything that you'd like to hear further details of. So let me begin by saying that I'm a knitter. Um, so you'll rarely see me without my yarn and needles. I work stitch by stitch to complete a complex pattern. And I would also say that for me, the process of knitting is far more interesting than any end product that might come out of it, such as what you see here. With each knitting project that I undertake, um, a lot of time and energy and effort goes into creating something that is built up from individual stitches to make row upon row and a pattern. And there are some great moments when I think I'm really getting the hang of it. And then inevitably I make mistakes and I have to go back. And in the going back or the on picking, the knitting term is frogging, but we won't go into that. So in the on picking, um, I realized that actually when I start again and rebuild stitch by stitch, row by row, I'm learning, um, I'm improving, and I'm getting a more complex understanding of the pattern I'm creating. So why am I talking about that? I'm using the metaphor of knitting to describe how sociologists work. Um, I'm suggesting to you that sociologists as a general group, and more specifically, sociologists of education, are a discipline of knitters, whether we know it or not. So we work hard over long periods to build and unpick the inner workings of society. And we do this in order to understand how our world works and the elements and patterns which comprise it. So when we want to think how things work, we want to consider some guiding questions. This presentation this morning has two of these. Firstly, I'm considering why the sociology of education is such an important field to consider. And in light of the really excellent introductions that we've had in the opening session, those are really thought provoking and thank you for them. They really fed into my thinking about the why. But also probably uh, in terms of the, the title of the conference, considering why now in these turbulent times, um, it's so important to consider this question. And again, going back to the, the point that was made about yesterday's momentous happenings in the USA. So I suppose the, let's consider the first question first, the why. 
As everyone knows, there is a long history of the sociology of education as a key theme in education and multiculturalism. It is really core to what we do. It drives practically everything that we do. I would argue that the sociology of education field has made many important contributions over the years to our understandings of how education functions, how it supports, but also shapes society and culture. And of course, the role of multiculturalism in that relationship. But it would be wrong to imagine that the sociology of education is understood by everyone in the same way. So that is why I'm using this word cloud to co consider the multiplicity of approaches. For example, this word cloud takes in the Bourdieuian approach, those who follow the theories and work of Pierre Bourdieu, who unpicks the dynamics of power and society and culture in such an incredibly interesting and engaging way and is such a huge influence um, in sociology of education today. Within this word cloud also, you'll see phrases from the work of Gramsci and others who have unpicked the concept of hegemony in society and try to use this to understand the patterns of behavior within our society. And within the word cloud, you'll also see approaches used more commonly by feminist sociological uh, theorists like myself, who try to unpick the politics of representation and consider how such power is held in these representations to uphold and I would suggest indeed to subvent um, patriarchal patterns. So if you go one step further, feminist sociologists value multiplicity and seek to promote diversity. And therefore, I would argue that such approaches can be particularly useful in these understandings and unpickings with regard to multiculturalism in the sphere of education. And overall, if as many sociologists do, you believe that society is comprised of complex patterns and elements, it's no stretch then to argue that our sociological approaches need to encompass and indeed, I would say, embrace this complexity. So the word cloud that you see here in front of you suggests even in its uh, physical approach, that uh, we are a, a community of equals. Our approaches in sociology of education are complementary to each other and equally useful depending on your perspective in the disciplines. So if we take all of that complexity on board then, how would we consider that the sociology of education can help us understand and unpick the worlds of education and multiculturalism? Because a first glance approach would suggest that education has an obvious, if detailed, function. It is to conserve, to produce, to transmit, to validate knowledge. And a first glance approach to multiculturalism might suggest that diversity and social inclusion are top of everyone's priority. But I would suggest to you, respectfully, that these are surface level approaches. And actually, that while these assumptions that I've given you a quick outline of there are correct, they don't unpick deeply enough. They don't um, consider the layers, the more dense, complicated patterns of approaches that are, I would suggest, more useful to us. So I'd like to do that now. So some sociologists view education primarily from a functional perspective. That is, they see the primary value of education as a means to socialize children and particularly to prepare them for their roles in society as adults. And within higher education, it would be considered in the functional approach that our role is to prepare learners for certain careers, perhaps with certain required skill sets. Within the conflict perspective, it would be considered uh, useful to see education of its nature as reinforcing inequality in society. And so studies which uh, take the conflict approach um, look at gender and class in the education system. And there are some really valuable and interesting studies in this field. I would just draw your attention, for example, to studies in gender role socialization, which examine how teachers' expectations, conscious or unconscious, may affect their students' motivation, engagement, and indeed success. And still others in these varying approaches to education take a symbolic interactionist perspective and focus on a social interaction that considers both in classrooms and other school settings, 
um, how students' approaches can be unpicked and understood. There are lots of very interesting studies, for example, looking at children's interactions in playgrounds and more active outdoor settings, which are really very, very useful. And indeed, some really good studies recently looking at teenagers in online interactions in the learning environments. So then, if we take a similarly varying approach to multiculturalism, we see that there are levels of interactions, multiple perspectives. We see, for example, that some multicultural um, approaches foreground equality and justice and see multiculturalism as a key tool to promote um, equality and justice, both in society and, of course, in education. Others within the multiculturalist approach look at social inclusion and diversity, and they see ways in which multiculturalist approaches in education can promote principles of social inclusion and diversity. And finally, there are others within the multiculturalist approach who foreground, who fo focus particularly on the ways in which strong multiculturalist approaches to education can build personal and self-efficacy, learning for democracy, civic education, and so on. And again, as I'm saying, these are complementary approaches. So such a multiplicity of approaches then I'm suggesting to you within the relationship between sociology of education, education and multiculturalism is a complex and multi-layered one. And it is this complexity and multi-layered approach, this plurality that I would suggest answers the why question. So let's go on now and consider the why now question. In the turbulent times in which we're operating, we need to consider both, of course, the ongoing planetary pandemic, but also, I would suggest, looking back over the last decade or so at global crises that have affected education. As we know, in the last decade, the world has been through and is going through a period of great social turbulence, whether we look to the economic crisis that began in 2008, or indeed the European migrant crisis that went right through the last decade, and of course now the ongoing COVID-19 global pandemic. And when we review these periods of crises, it's natural um, to focus on negatives. It's natural to consider that society is facing unprecedented challenges, which are having a massive negative impact. And this impact is permeating through all levels and aspects of society. And of course, that includes education. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that such a, uh, a, a, an approach is not uh, reasonable and recognized. However, I'm suggesting that, in fact, it is a choice, one I choose to make, to think of positive impacts of sociology of education in these periods of crisis. In fact, I would respectfully argue that it is such turbulent times that make these positive approaches uh, more important than ever. So that's, I hope, answered the why now question. And I'd like to turn in the second part of my presentation now to look at and share some examples of our own research where interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary and collaborative approaches um, have brought such positive outcomes. And these include promoting multiculturalist approaches, promoting inclusion and diversity, and uh, really having very strong personal and sectoral impacts. I'd like to point out just before I get into the individual examples that all of these examples that I've chosen to present this morning can be read in their entirety in published academic papers. And I've included the references for these in the resources section of this presentation. So what I'm hoping to do in this few minutes now is really just to give you a flavor of these projects. And of course, any of the questions in the discussion that might come through will also help to elucidate their key points. So um, just to say that uh, before, before we go on. So then, if, if all of that is clear, Let's look at the first project. And the first project that I'm taking to this morning as an example centers on academic scholarship. Now, we know that academic scholarship is a recognized pillar of education at all levels. We know that it has a, a really crucial role um, in allowing those of us working in education to disseminate best practice. 
and in doing that, to be innovative in our approaches and in doing that, to show a diversity of results. And this diversity of results, again, going back to the excellent opening session, is very important in recognising um, the multi-level approaches within society and education specifically to scholarship. And that in itself um, is valuable in terms of showing that diversity. So we know that the key skills in academic scholarship are authoring, reviewing and editing, the well-known triumvirate of publishing skills and activities. But it has been my experience, and I think it's been an experience uh, commonly held, that these three skills are often viewed in a rigid hierarchy and indeed as completely separate entities. Uh, a very bounded approach, I would suggest. But I would argue that this crucial space of academic scholarship, which connects academic and professional domains, can and indeed I believe should be less bounded by specialist or institutional norms. In other words, I would suggest that instead of seeing difference and separation, we choose instead to see connection and similarity. So between the skill sets and between those involved in them, I would suggest respectfully that this project created a very collaborative approach which had really positive outcomes. I'd also suggest that these positive outcomes have a really broad rippling effect within the wider education sector. I would just briefly consider the positive outcomes relating to the building of networking skills, the fostering of confidence at all levels, the raising of important knowledge and skills and scholarship, and indeed all of this feeding into the flexible identities that we as blended professionals these days are meant to have where everybody talks about being a blended professional, but does anyone ever really consider how you become such? I'm suggesting to you that this project that I'm describing now, which I'll give you a bit of detail about now in a moment, actually leads to the building of that blended professional approach. So to give you a brief overview, my Dundalk Institute of Technology colleague and friend, Dr. Karen Dunn and I, put these principles of collaboration and mentorship into practice when we co-edited and published a joint special issue of the All-Ireland Journal of Teaching and Learning and Higher Education, which we published in February 2018. I'm suggesting that crucial to the success of this project was previous relationships and collaborations. My co-editor and I had successfully collaborated on a number of projects in the past, and one of which I'll be de describing again in a moment in example two. So we had the benefit of previous experience of knowing each other, working well together, knowing each other's skills and preferences. And this, I believe, was a crucial foundation for the success of the project. We also made use of the expertise encompassed in a number of networks, national and international. And I'll just name them because they were so important uh, and supportive in the project. There was the All-Ireland Society for Higher Education, that is AISH. There was the All-Ireland Journal for Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, that is AISHJ, that I've mentioned already. And of course, there was the European Sociological Association in a general sense. And of course, my own home ground, as it were, the Research Network 10 Sociology of Education. And again, the coordinator at that time was Professor Mika van Houten, and uh, Mika gave us great support help, friendship, support, and the rest of it. So it wasn't our first time working with these networks, are the individuals like Mika within them. And these previous relationships were a great stepping stone for the success of the project. Because not only in engaging authors and reviewers, but also in terms of the international context that we were able to bring to the joint special issue, we were able to encompass a very wide, broad range of interests, levels, and experiences, which created to, I would suggest, the success of the joint special issue, which was published. The project, as I said, also fostered confidence and built skills across the sector, nationally and internationally. And I would argue that these are vital skills in promoting excellence in scholarship for one, but also excellence in research and innovation for two. The resulting issue is called the Higher Education, Inclusivity and Organisational Change, 
And as I say, I've included the link in the resources section. And I would invite you all to have a look at some stage to see the broad range of disciplines and topics and indeed the contributors um, within, that, within that special issue. Of course, what you won't see if you click on the link is the much broader range of uh, interests and experiences, the individuals and networks who were the broad, broad spectrum support for the project, but of course, still, they were a very important uh, element within it. Within our experiences in publishing the joint special issue, my colleague and I also considered these uh, experiences in the broader sphere of an inclusive approach to academic scholarship. And in fact, these considerations are published as an academic paper and the link again to that is in the resources section. So that's the first example, and it is very much um, a, a good stepping stone for the second example, because some of the method was the same. We had the same uh, colleague, Dr. Karen Dunn, and uh, we had the same collaborative and uh, interactive uh, approach that we took in the first example. So let me tell you a little bit now about the second example, which relates to teachers' professional development in education. We know from many studies, and I've included a number of these in the resources section from the ESF, the EU, the EC, and indeed the OECD. We know that the development of academics' teaching skills is core to ongoing reforms in the education sector. And this second example describes a recent project in Irish higher education, which was interdisciplinary and interinstitutional in nature, where a working group was formed with the same networking outreach approach as I've described in the first example. We collaborated face to face and virtually to engage with the framework for professional development, which had just been published at that time by the National Forum for the Enhancement of Teaching and Learning in Higher Education, which is known as NFTL and is, for those who don't know, the umbrella body for teacher, teaching and learning in Ireland. I would suggest that some of the positive outcomes of this project were, again, and you'll find similarities with the previous one, and you should, the development of collaboration and mentorship skills, the building of a community of practice, which so many sh studies are showing have huge benefits in the education sector, the use of technology, again, which is becoming so important in education, certainly in the last year, but also I would, I would suggest uh, in the last decade. And indeed, the development of reflection and self-reflection skills, skills which many studies are showing to be vital in promoting excellence in teaching and learning, and again, I would say, in research. And again, to say to you, an academic paper describing this project has just been published in an international education journal named Teaching Teacher Development, and the link is included, as I said. So that's the first and second examples, and you can see there's very strong connections between them, um, and that's the strength of them. The third example I'd like to talk to you about has some connections, but also some quite specific differences. The third example um, is a project which looked at uh, combining the skills of social science and computer science to, com to come at a, the education sector in a computational way, uh, which was very uh, successful. Uh, the ways that sociology of education makes positive impacts on education is contained in this project, but it's also broadened out. The project examined the social support networks of a complete class group of learners, with a particular comparison between mature learners and others, and between male and female learners. We combined <clears throat> methodologically social network analysis methods with a mixed methods approach, and examined the social roles and network patterns within social network data, which we gathered from this complete class group of learners in the higher education sector. So what did this project and social network analysis entail? We examined the strength of social ties to, a, to consider the support network patterns of the learn, learner subgroups, particularly looking at, as I said, mature learners and others and male and female learners. And we did this to interrogate the meaning of online social relationships. We considered the social strength of online ties and we considered the relationship between the existence of these ties and the expectations that the individuals involved had about these social ties 
So we looked a little bit more deeply. We, you might say, unpicked or frogged the relationships that on the surface seemed to be similar. And we looked at what these relationships had in, uh, told us about the, the implied relationship within the learner group. We used these analyses then to draw inferences about the support networks on which learners re rely. We considered how learners in an educational setting access or indeed do not access the social supports which they require. And we also considered whether the successful access to such supports is influenced by a learner's position in the social structure of the learner group. And whether indeed accessing these supports is considered by the learners to have a significant impact on their learning experience. And you can see, I hope, how that all has connections to what I said earlier. We were particularly interested in considering both social in isolation, if we found examples of such, and social integration, if we found examples of such. And indeed, the project uncovered both. That is, we found examples whereby social isolation was a significant deterrent within the positive learning experience, particularly of mature students. We also found in this project examples where social integration, that is, individuals or networks of individuals who are key to functioning support networks, were crucial to the success of both individual and we would argue class success in the learning experience. So such projects as this particular one, I would suggest, are really crucial if we are to build and unpick the role of social supports in education. And if they are to provide insights into the learner experience for all. And again, I would suggest that the insights that it provided in mature learners um, were very valuable. Um, Actually, this particular academic paper is being published later today um, in the launch of a new Irish journal called the Irish Journal of Academic Practice. So the link is not quite live yet, but it will be available very soon. And if anyone would like it, you can get in touch with Anna or indeed myself and we'll, we'll send it on to you if that is of interest to you. So the last project then that I'd like to look at um, is a, a very recent one. Um, and it's one that is an example of a rapid response online collaboration. So the first and second projects were very much about face to face and online. And the third project was looking at the social uh, net support networks of learners. This one is a uh, similar but different again. Um, it's a project that I was involved in in 2020 as part of the European Commission response to the COVID-19 restrictions. The project was called the EU versus Virus Hackathon. And as I say, it was an example of a large scale online collaboration, which brought together huge ranges of individuals, organizations, companies, communities and networks. It stemmed, as I said, from the European Commission and originally was supposed to include primarily European individuals and networks. But in fact, the project um, had an a, added unexpected benefit of actually drawing in expertise from around the globe. And this was something that was a hugely unexpected but extremely welcome outcome of the project, of the hackathon. The idea of the hackathon was not just to reflect on the devastating effects of the coronavirus pandemic, and from the point of view of sociologists, the societal restrictions and impacts arising from this devastation, but in fact, both reflect on, but also react to, and come up with actual, real, and applied solutions to many of the societal issues um, that, were, that were arising. So let me just briefly describe the project for you. The hackathon took place over three long days from the 24th to the 26th of April in 2020. Let me just clarify what I mean by the long days. Um, those of us involved in ordinary everyday work, even if it's an online, uh, situation, we'll go online at maybe eight or nine or go to work at eight or nine, come home at five or six. This hackathon began actually on the Friday morning and it didn't stop right through. In fact, it ran over into Monday morning because of some technical problems. It was, I would suggest to you, a 72 hour project in, in every sense of the word of that. And that in itself was a sea change for many of us working on the project. 
The winners were invited to take part in what was called the Matchathon or a follow up event. And this occurred the following month. Again, the timeline is so telescoped, as you can see, in May 2020. And in the Matchathon, they went on to link up with relevant investors, developers, companies and so on. And again, you can see how the online collaboration was crucial to the success of those outcomes. There were six domains in the hackathon and I chose to be involved in the remote working and education domain because of my uh, background and interests. And I also chose to work as a mentor to teams developing projects in that domain. There were some really standout points about this project which uh, were new, uh, had never happened before. And certainly personally speaking, I'd never seen anything like them before. The first really standout point was the very short preparation time. So I've mentioned that it was an EU commission project. I've mentioned that it was a global project. And yet when I tell you that there were three weeks um, all inclusive to, from the beginning to the end of the preparation time, the lead in time to this project, you will hardly believe me. I could hardly believe it myself. As I say, the project time itself only encompassed three full days. And yet it took in over 20,000 participants and over 2,000 final project proposals. So that's not taking in the number of projects that did not go forward, but the over 2,000 that went forward from the hackathon. Out of these, 117 were awarded, with six overall winners in each domain from cash prizes of a total of 100,000 euro. But I think what's so important to remember wasn't the final outcome of that, but that the, the, the process, the project, the ongoing work that went into it was just incredible. Just for your own interest, you might be interested in the overall winner in the remote working and education challenge in which I was involved. The project was entitled The Village, Where the World is Your Classroom. The team participants in this project came from Switzerland, the Ukraine, the United States and India. So if ever you were to see an example of multicultural collaboration, and that's it, I would suggest. And the project aimed to develop an online village platform to facilitate experiential virtual learning. So when we look at the online collaboration, which was the EU versus virus hackathon project, the positive outcomes which come from it really centered on the pooling of people power. It centered on building with a technological framework and the technology is hugely developed described in the, in the paper and I won't go into that here, but the technology supported the personal interaction. And it all happened, as I say, in such a short time frame. And also, I would very respectfully suggest that it was not a talking shop, that the projects that came out of it were real and innovative and un, uh, unusual and went forward to make a contribution, as I say, to combat the societal restrictions of COVID-19 restrictions. Again, as I say, this project is described in a published paper available in the resources, or at least ask me about it in the discussion. So having described some of the projects that I think really uh, encapsulate the interdisciplinary approach, can I summarise those and maybe consider the ways in which we can learn from them and, um, and consider where they, where they can maybe fit in in our thinking today in this conference and indeed tomorrow. I have argued in my presentation that it is the plurality of perspectives within sociology of education that I believe to be of enormous value to education and multiculturalism. I've described some of the positive impacts, but I'd just like to summarise them now again for you and maybe just describe them personally as also. I'd like to suggest that scholarship which is enriched is scholarship which is um, broad, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary and collaborative. And I'm suggesting that that enriched scholarship has a hugely important role to play in making research innovative and informed. So the approach that there is a duality and there is a reciprocal relationship between scholarship and research to me seems to be the linchpin of that project. Um, I'm also suggesting to you that there are great positive impacts in creating dynamic and active teachers. I'm a teacher myself over 30 years, and I know from my own personal experience and the many, many studies that exist that teachers' professional development, when properly carried out, can lead to extremely 
uh, strong, active teachers. And that's very important. I think it's crucial to consider ways that we, we can work through and consider ways that that works there. The other thing I'd suggest to you is that when we look at learners, the social supports of learners are ways that we need to unpick and consider the learner groups. And we'd really like to make sure that we build social supports that create and uh, contribute to more engaged learners. And as I said, with regard to that project, more uh, particularly with regard to mature learners. And finally, I'd like to finish by suggesting that collaboration on a massive scale, such as we saw in the EU versus virus hackathon, is also part of that building and unpicking that I described earlier in terms of our approach as the sociologist. So the knitting uh, a method, if you like. And if everything else uh, fails, I would suggest to you that if you can just keep on knitting as I do, really, it's, it's, it's worth anything. And I would really recommend for you to take it up. Um, I won't show you now the resources other than to tell you that they exist and other than to tell you that if you are interested, I can forward them to you. And indeed, so can Anna. And um, I just need to thank Anna again for allowing me to describe some of the work that I'm involved in. And back to you, Anna. Thank you so very much for this uh, a very enlightening presentation. <laughs> And I would like to ask uh, participants if they have any questions to write them in the chat. Whilst I would like to invite Professor Michael Brown, uh, who is presenting for himself and his team of researchers from Northern Ireland. Uh, Professor Brown, the floor is yours.